We've spent a couple videos exploring factorization within integral domains, and we've come up with the notion of a unique factorization domain and a principal ideal domain. So we want to introduce a new structure in this video that uh, moves on from a principal ideal domain to something even nicer, and that's called a Euclidean domain. So let's go ahead and look at the definition. So an integral domain D is known as a Euclidean domain if we've got this function n that goes from the domain D to the natural numbers, and this is called a norm function or evaluation function, depending on which authors you're looking at, and it has these two properties. So if you've got two non-zero elements in the integral domain, we'll call them A and B, then the norm of A has to be less than or equal to the norm of A times B. So what this means, if you're multiplying by a non-zero element, then that only takes you higher in the norm, okay, or keeps you the same. The next thing, if A and B are in the domain where B is not equal to zero, then you can form something like division with remainder. So you've got these elements Q and R which are in the domain where A equals B times Q plus R, where either R is equal to zero, that would be like a remainder of zero, or the norm of R is less than the norm of B. So in other words, the size of R is less than the size of B. So we've seen this kind of division algorithm type thing in other rings already and this is just some sort of abstraction of that notion. And there are two quick examples that we've already seen and one is the integers where the norm is just given by the absolute value function. So that's a nice quick example. Another is polynomials over a field. So let's let k be any field. We look at k adjoin x and in this case our norm is just given by the degree. So we've seen a bunch of things that uh, point to similarities between z and k adjoin x, but underlying all of those is that they're Euclidean domains. Okay, so we want to look at another example, and that would be something called the Gaussian integers. So those are all complex numbers of the form a plus bi, where a and b are integers. We're going to show that this is a Euclidean domain. So. Let's look at the proof of this. And so first, we need to figure out what a norm function would be. So let's define the norm function in the following way. So let's say the norm of alpha, where alpha is coming from z adjoin i, is just um, alpha times alpha bar. In other words, the modulus of alpha squared. Where just as a reminder here, if I have alpha equals a plus bi, then that means alpha bar is equal to a minus bi. And that makes the norm of alpha equal to a squared plus b squared. So now the next thing we want to do is check this first property of the norm function. So let's say that alpha and beta are both Gaussian integers and we want to look at the norm of alpha times beta. So we're going to use some properties of multiplication within complex numbers here to make it all simpler, but you can check these details. It's uh, fairly easy, just pushing symbols around. So the norm of alpha times beta is alpha beta times alpha beta bar. But now we can use the fact that complex conjugation and uh, multiplication commute with each other. So in other words, we can write this as alpha beta, alpha bar, beta bar. And now we can commute the complex multiplication. So we have alpha, alpha bar, beta, beta bar. So that's exactly equal to the norm of alpha times the norm of beta. So in this case, the norm function is a multiplicative function. But now we can notice that the norm of a Gaussian integer is only zero when that integer is equal to zero, and otherwise it's bigger than or equal to one. And we can notice that unless a and b are both zero, this thing is going to be bigger than or equal to one, given the fact that a and b are both integers in the first first place. So in other words, this guy right here has got to be bigger than or equal to 1, making this whole thing bigger than or equal to n alpha, which is exactly what we wanted if we look at the extreme left and right hand side of this. Okay, so that means it satisfies the first property. I'm going to go ahead and clean up the board and we'll go to the second property. All right, we just got done proving this first property for the Gaussian integers. Now we want to move on to the second property. In other words, the division with remainder property. So let's go ahead and suppose that alpha and beta are elements of these Gaussian integers and beta is not equal to zero. And this is important. Since beta is not equal to zero, that means it's invertible 
in the complex numbers. And that's exactly what we'll look at first is what's happening within the complex numbers. Before we do that, I want to decompose these into real and imaginary parts. So let's say alpha is equal to a plus bi and beta is equal to c plus di. And now we want to look at alpha beta inverse. And so uh, maybe just as a reminder what beta inverse is, so that's going to be equal to c minus di over c squared plus d squared. So that's equal to beta conjugate over um, the magnitude of beta squared. In other words, the modulus of beta. And so that's like a result from just complex number multiplication, which isn't too hard to see. So that means alpha beta inverse can be written as a plus bi times c minus di over c squared plus d, d squared. So now what I want to do is multiply out that numerator and then decompose it into real and imaginary parts. So notice I'm going to go ahead and take this 1 plus c, 1 over c squared plus d squared out front. Now if I foil out the numerator and keep real parts and imaginary parts separately, let's see what I get. So I have a times c, that's going to be one of the real parts, and then b times negative d, but that's going to be times i squared, so that's going to be plus b times d. So that's going to be our other real part. And now let's look at the imaginary part. So we'll have um, b times c will be an imaginary part. And then minus a times d, that'll be another imaginary part. So I'll put that like this. So now I've got my real part and my imaginary part. So now the next thing that I'll do is I'll write this as AC plus BD over C squared plus D squared plus BC minus AD over C squared plus D squared times I. The next thing we want to do is take these two numbers, which are rational numbers, and write them as integers plus something you can think of like a remainder. So let's go ahead and do that. I'll write this one as Q1 plus R1, so that's like our real part, plus Q2 plus R2 times I, and we can always do this where R1 and R2 lie between negative a half and positive a half. There's actually a version of the division algorithm which allows you to get that kind of remainder, but let me sketch out why this is the case. So let's suppose we've got any real number x. So these are obviously uh, rational numbers, but we could do this for any real number. So let's look about where x would be on the number line. So notice it's going to lie in between the following integers. Maybe that could include those integers, but it'll be in between them, the floor of x and the ceiling of x. So we know that when we put x on the number line, it'll be somewhere on that closed interval. But now what we're going to do is pull that closed interval apart into two pieces. And we're going to do that by inserting the midpoint here. So let's go ahead and insert the midpoint. And that means that that distance right there is a half and that distance right there is a half. Now if we throw x here, it can land two places. It can land in this portion right here or it can land in this portion right here. So those are our two possibilities for x. It could land right in the middle, but that's like being in both portions, so you can consider that both ways. Now, notice that in this yellow version, we can write x as the floor of x plus r1, where maybe r1 is this number right here. But it's clear in this case that R1 is between zero and a half. Because notice we are at most at this midpoint. So now let's what ha see what's happening with this other bit. In this other bit, we can write x as the ceiling of x um, plus R2. But now notice that R2 is between negative a half and zero. Again, for the same reason, because we overshoot up to the ceiling and then we have to work back. So this right here is like our R2. So any way you run it, you can rewrite 
a real number or a rational number in this case as an integer plus a number between negative a half and a half. And that's what we've done for both of these parts. And here I should say that Q1 and Q2 are both integers. Okay, great. So now we're here. I'm gonna go ahead and bring that up and then we'll move on to the next step. On the last board, we argued that we could take this alpha beta inverse and write it as Q1 plus R1 plus Q2 plus R2 times I, where Q1 and Q2 are integers and R1 and R2 are between negative half and half. Now I wanna rewrite this a little bit. I'm gonna go ahead and write this as Q1 plus um, Q2 times I plus R1 plus R2 times I. So this is like my quotient and this is like my remainder. So notice that this guy is an element of the Gaussian integers because we know that Q1 and Q2 are integers. So let's go ahead and call this thing maybe gamma, um, which like I said, is an element of Z adjoint I. We can't do anything with that next part just yet, but we will be able to soon. Now let's go ahead and multiply both sides by uh, beta. So that gives me alpha equals beta times gamma from this part plus beta times R1 plus R2 times I. Great. But now what I want to do is notice that alpha is an element of Z adjoint I, beta and gamma are both elements of Z adjoint I, which tells us that this thing that's left over, which we'll go ahead and call rho, is also an element of Z adjoint I. Okay, so to reiterate, this is an element of the ring that we want, this is an element of the ring that we want, so we can, when we combine them, we get an element of our ring that we want, which makes this thing an element of that ring. So notice here we have alpha equals beta gamma plus rho, um, which looks like the right kind of form for this division with remainder. Now we just need to look at the norm of rho. So notice that the norm of rho, so now we can use this formula for our norm function. That's going to be beta times beta bar times r1 plus r2i times r1 minus r2i. But that's equal to the norm of beta and then r1 squared plus r2 squared. But recall that r1 and r2 are between negative half and half, which makes r1 squared and r2 squared between a quarter and zero. So when we add them together, we get something less than or equal to a half, but that is most definitely strictly less than the norm of beta, which is exactly what we want to satisfy this second rule for a Euclidean algorithm. So we finished our proof. This is a Euclidean domain. Okay, great. I'm gonna clean up the board and then we're gonna prove a result that all Euclidean domains are in fact PIDs. We just got done proving that the Gaussian integers form a Euclidean domain. Now we wanna prove that every Euclidean domain is a PID. So this is nice because this will prove that the Gaussian integers is actually a PID as well. Um, okay, so let's go ahead and get going. So let's suppose that um, I in D is an ideal, and what we want to do is show that it is principal. So want to show I is generated by a single element A. Okay, the structure of this proof is very much gonna parallel the way that we proved that these were PIDs. So you might wanna look at that um, kinda after we do this or maybe pause this video and check that out. So the first thing that we wanna do is take some element B in I such that the norm of B is minimal among all elements from that ideal I. So we did the same kind of thing over here with uh, the size of the absolute value or the degree of whichever polynomial. Okay, good. Now uh, notice that we immediately have this principal ideal generated by B is a sub-object of I. Now we just want to show that it goes the other way as well. So let's go ahead and take an arbitrary element from the ideal. 
and then do the division algorithm. So in other words, find Q and R with um, this thing happening. So we have A equals B, Q plus R, where two things happen. Either R is equal to zero or or the norm of R is less than the norm of B. So we want to show that R has to be equal to zero. Well, notice that here we have R is equal to A minus B Q. We'll notice that A is in I and B is also in I. So that means that R is in I. Great. But if we had the norm of R less than the norm of B, that would contradict the minimality of the norm of B from the elements from I. So what that tells us is that R has to be equal to zero. So let's just go ahead and put otherwise we would contradict the minimality of norm of B. Okay, good. So we've got R is equal to zero, but what that tells us is that we can rewrite this equation as A equals B times Q, but that's mostly an element of the principal ideal generated by B, but reading this line and this line shows us that the entire ideal is a sub-object of the principal ideal generated by B. But now looking at this and this, we see that that means that they are in fact the same. So let's see what we did. We started with an arbitrary ideal. We did this trick with the division algorithm, which we are allowed to do because we're in a Euclidean domain, to get that our ideal is actually a principal ideal, which is exactly what we wanted to do. Okay, so now that's a good place to stop.